Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 147 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we visit the National Nuclear Museum located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, and I know many of you have, and thank you, but take a second to like, share, or subscribe and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon and you'll get notifications of new episodes when they are posted. Now, Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about our CAF events, the aircraft, our local units, or how you can be part of the fun, just visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you're watching tonight, you might have some questions. Just type those into the chat box and we'll try to answer them either during the program or before we sign off tonight. So as I said, we are going to Albuquerque, New Mexico, the National Nuclear Museum. It is an institution dedicated to preserving and presenting the history and science of nuclear energy and its impact on our society. It's been around since 1969. We're gonna find out more from the president and CEO, Jennifer Hayden, in just a moment. We'll meet her in person, but first, Got uh, a little video introduction that uh, we hope you will enjoy. So sit back and relax and uh, enjoy the video. Welcome to the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Established in 1969, the Smithsonian Affiliate is located in sunny Albuquerque, New Mexico, telling the story of the atomic age from early developments to today's peaceful uses of nuclear technology. We're the only congressionally chartered museum in the nuclear field and a must-see destination in the Southwest. At the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, we welcome audiences of all backgrounds who want to learn about the science and history of nuclear, including energy, healthcare, space exploration, global leadership, innovation, and technology. Some of our most popular exhibits invite our guests of all ages to get to know nuclear by interacting and having fun. Thanks to amazing partners in the nuclear energy industry, we love seeing visitors learn about clean, reliable, and carbon-free energy that is generated by nuclear technology. With science being a focus for our National Museum, engaging and interactive STEM activities are a must. It is in Little Al's lab that you can explore various types of science through hands-on, free choice learning. Nuclear has impacted so much of our culture and we have some of the coolest objects from movie posters to cars. Whether our guests are interested in learning about nuclear's contributions to transforming healthcare, leading to cutting edge medical technology that impacts our lives daily, or if they lean more towards history, we have something for everyone. Nuclear is very relevant to New Mexico because it is where the atomic age began with the Manhattan Project. Our museum presents an in-depth collection of artifacts that represent global leadership and defense, both past and present. From the Manhattan Project and Cold War, nuclear technology has played a pivotal role writing our world's history. And no matter what, you won't want to miss our nine-acre outdoor exhibit area, Heritage Park. You will walk back in time as you experience behemoth aircraft and significant aspects of nuclear history. That was a very quick tour of the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope you stop by soon for a longer visit to learn, think, imagine, and draw your own conclusions. I am Jennifer Hayden with the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, and we are in our outdoor exhibit area, Heritage Park. 
So this is a nine acre outdoor exhibit area that has airplanes, we have missiles, we have a nuclear submarine sail behind me, all kinds of artifacts and objects that are too big to go inside the museum. So with Heritage Park, we have airplanes that I'm about to throw a lot of numbers and letters at you all at once. We have our B-29 Super Fortress, which is the same type of airplane as the Enola Gay that ended World War II. We have the B-52 Strata Fortress that has a surface area of over three quarters of an acre. It is so huge. Also, it is the last airplane in American history to drop a nuclear bomb for testing purposes, but it is Albuquerque's airplane that went straight from Boeing to Albuquerque, and it's been here ever since now at our museum. We have a B-47 Stratojet. We have an F-16 Fighting Falcon. There's so many airplanes here. Our submarine cell is the USS James K. Polk nuclear submarine cell, and with this, people ask me all the time, do you have a submarine underneath the ground? Unfortunately, we do not. That would be very, very cool if we did. But we also have a Trinity Tower. So the Trinity Tower is the 100-foot steel tower. It's a replica of the one that was used in 1945 to hold the world's very first atomic bomb, the Gadget, that was tested in White Sands, New Mexico. The Trinity test was a very difficult time. Here we have the gadget. This is a device that was used to test the Trinity weapon. Now they used it and called it the gadget because they did not want to use the word bomb. There were spies at that time trying to steal the secrets of the United States and use them to their advantage during the war. The gadget, and this is one of the only ones there is, was a device that included high explosive lenses that would implode and crush a piece of plutonium down to criticality level causing an explosion. This is what was tested at Trinity. Another reason that the atomic age is so very relevant to New Mexico, to where the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History is housed here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, would be the Trinity test. So that was the world's very first testing of the atomic bomb, July 16th, 1945. So this is when all of the work and the progress from the Manhattan Project was taken to White Sands, New Mexico. When they hoisted the world's very first atomic bomb up a 100 foot steel tower to see what would happen when it was detonated. So on this 100 foot steel tower, there is a shed at the very top that the bomb went into. And then all of the scientists, the engineers, military people, everyone went about 10 miles away to see exactly what would happen, not knowing what would happen to the world with the world's very first atomic bomb. So in our Trinity area, our exhibit at the museum, we have artifacts and objects such as the bomb casings of Fat Man and Little Boy, which were the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki ending World War II. We have limousines, Oppenheimer's limo, that is said to have driven Oppenheimer back and forth between Los Alamos and the Trinity site. J. Robert Oppenheimer decided to test the plutonium bomb, or gadget, in the desert of the Alamogordo bombing range about 240 miles from Los Alamos. Oppenheimer named the site Trinity, inspired by John Donne's poetry, Batter My Heart, Three-Personed God. Elsie McMillan asked her husband Ed what to expect. Things were moving fast now. There soon would be a test near Alamogordo at White Sands the very place we had visited with carefree abandon a few years ago. I asked Ed in all innocence what would happen. It seemed an easy question with a simple answer. Knowing that it was an atomic bomb they were testing should have made me more aware of what would be involved. It was difficult for Ed to tell me. He finally answered, there will be about 50 of us present, key workers. We ourselves are not absolutely certain what will happen. In spite of calculations, we are going into the unknown. We know that there are three possibilities. One, that we will all be blown to bits if it is more powerful than we expect. If this happens, you and the world will be immediately told. Two, 
it may be a complete dud. If this happens, you will also be told. Third, it may, as we hope, be a success. We pray without loss of any lives. In this case, there will be a broadcast to the world with a plausible explanation for the noise and the tremendous flash of light which will appear in the sky. With our alarm set for 2.30 a.m., Ed would leave at 3.15. We did not want to allow much time. We did not want to say goodbye. World War II was an immense war. Over 61 million people died during the war, all across the world. It was a world war. And the United States was building two atomic weapons to use to end it. The thought was that it might be possible to use them in Europe and to defeat the Nazis. But the Nazis actually were defeated before the bombs were ready. So the bombs became available to end the war with Japan. During this time, in the Pacific area, the United States was fighting an intense battle with the Japanese. We were slowly taking the islands out in the Pacific. And so we did take an island known as Tinian, where we staged the bombing raid on Japan for these atomic weapons. Now the atomic weapons fit into the American bombing campaign, and we were bombing Japan with fire bombs and burning their cities down in an attempt to take away their capability to fight. But they would not give up. So the United States used the two atomic weapons on two towns, two cities in Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those are the only two places where an atomic weapon has been deployed in wartime. And those cities were destroyed. Many were killed, thousands, and then thousands were exposed after that fact to radiation and sickness and death. The war, however, was ended, and quickly. World War II ended in the fall of 1945 with the American use of the atomic weapons. The Japanese emperor came forward and overruled his war council and uh, suspended the war. And essentially, it was over. At that time, the United States felt like the use of the atomic weapons made a show for the Russians, for the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was an ally of the United States during World War II, yet we did not want to share the secret of how to create an atomic weapon with them. Only four years later, the Russians, under the Soviet Union and Stalin, successfully tested an atomic bomb of their own. This caused the United States to move forward into a crash program to build additional weapons, and that started the Cold War. The Cold War was an intense time for our world. Although it didn't result in an atomic exchange, we came close several times. And we built an immense arsenal. Many countries did, principally the United States and the Soviet Union. We went from having two bombs to thousands during the 1960s and 70s. This museum has the largest collection of those materials that are unclassified that people can understand and look at. And here in this gallery, many of them are found. During this time, you heard about things like duck and cover, civil defense, and the uh, sense that the United States would be able to do first strike. Other things that were discussed were mad. That's not being angry. MAD stood for Mutually Assured Destruction. This was a doctrine of our government that would essentially annihilate many people who were citizens. Millions could die if there had been an exchange. There was a thing that was created called the Triad. The Triad was a defense attempt using submarines and hardened silo-mounted missiles and bomber dropped atomic weapons in an attempt to make it impossible for the Soviet Union to survive a second strike. 
and we did not have a hot war or World War III during the Cold War. The Cold War ended in the 1990s, the early 90s, as the Soviet Union and communism in that area collapsed. Though today, the world is still not a safe place. Atomic weapons are still out there. There we go. And joining us now, live, rather than being on tape, Jennifer Hayden. Jennifer, thank you so much for uh, for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, in, we're looking at a, a picture of the exterior of the building. This is not the uh, original location that uh, was formed in 1969. Take us back in, in time and in history a little bit. Sure. So our museum was established in 1969, and we were located on Kirtland Air Force Base. Um, really, the mission of the museum began telling the story of nuclear weapons more than anything. But over time, it started evolving to tell more story as far as nuclear weapons moving to the entire story of the atomic age from early developments to today's peaceful uses. We were on Kirtland Air Force Base for a very, very long time until 9-11 happened. When 9-11 happened, we had to close our doors permanently on base by noon on that day. And at that point in time, our board of trustees got together and we were able to rent a facility in Old Town, Albuquerque. Old Town is a very large culturally significant tourism destination within the town. And we were there for seven years while we raised the $10 million to build the facility that we are in now. We moved in officially in April of 2009. So we are on our 15th year um, at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History located on Eubank Boulevard. And uh, the, the gentleman that was in the, the video before was actually your uh, predecessor. He was. So Jim Walther was the, he is the retired executive director of the museum and has, he was with our museum as our leader for 26 years. And I had the opportunity to work with him. Now I'm going on 15 years at the museum. I've been president and CEO for a little over a year. I was deputy director for quite a while, director of communications. Um, but Jim saw so much of it as far as coming on in 1996 and then he was here when we did have to shut our doors due to 9-11 happening moving us to old town moving us to where we are now going through covid it was a it was he experienced a lot of things in his time at the museum so here's here's the the burning question so far how does how does one become the uh, the director of this uh, museum oh. how, did, how did you land that so I, again, I have been with the museum going on 15 years. My background is more communications, but museums have already always been my passion. My grandfather was on the USS Enterprise um, during World War II. And I would travel with my grandfather and my grandmother every summer with my older sister. And he would take us to naval bases. We would go to museums. That's when I was on my first aircraft carrier, submarine, destroyer, um, in museum type settings. And I really fell in love with it. And I do believe it was because of my grandfather. And moving to Albuquerque, I'm originally from West Texas. Moving to Albuquerque, I went into the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History, and I went back to school during my time there to get my master's in museum studies. And I have done quite a bit of speaking around the nation for Nuclear Science Week, really focusing on nuclear energy. It's just become a, a passion of mine. And this museum and the success of the museum and my team members is very, very important to me. That's incredible. Uh, and with the, with the uh, the museum itself, it's a Smithsonian uh, affiliate. Uh, was there any, or is there any interaction between um, between the museum now and uh, the Los Alamos National Lab? 
Oh, yes. Actually, I was in Los Alamos just a few weeks ago. So we we try to partner as much as possible. And I'm hoping to partner more with the Los Alamos Historical Society and Museum. And the Bradbury is the museum by the Los Alamos National Labs. It's The Bradbury is part of their um, laboratory system. So it's always a partnership. I think with any museum, it's never, ever competition. It's how can we raise each other up and partner in any way possible. Um, laboratories are very important to us. We are right down the street from San Diego National Laboratories. Um, and of course, their missions are very important to us because of so much of what we have in our collection as far as nuclear weapons, global defense, um, all of that area. Great. Well, let's uh, kind of peek behind the behind the doors and uh, look at uh, some of the exhibits that are that are on display inside the museum. Sure. Let's start with this one. So this area, again, our museum, and I had said it in the video, y'all, you really kind of watched me grow up in some of those videos over the years. I thought, woo! <laughs> um, but with this, we do tell the story, the atomic age, so Manhattan Project and Cold War to peaceful uses. And the peaceful uses generally do encompass nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, and space exploration. So we do have a nuclear medicine exhibition, and this is one of the artifacts within that exhibition area. We are looking to update it, um, restore, and actually revamp and add more artifacts to it. Since we've been in the museum now for 15 years in our current location, it is important to us to try to make sure all of our technology is updated and we're showing the most unbiased, well-balanced view of everything. So this is just a small, small peek into our nuclear medicine exhibit. And what is the machine that we're looking at? This one actually, and I do believe it's a Spectre Chrome device. I'm not 100% sure. I'm actually trying to read this. Out of all the areas, I have to admit, I'm not I'm the least versed in nuclear medicine, but that is why we really find our docents to be one of the best things about the museum. And I was just, that was something that I always tell people that so many of our volunteers and docents are retired, whether they're laboratory, um, Los Alamos, Sandia, Oak Ridge, uh, retired military, veterans, um, doctors. And so when we have the right docent, even if someone, if I'm giving a tour and they ask a question, I'll say, give me just one minute. Let me see if I can find the right person for you. And then we'll go over and talk about it. Well, and, it, you know, it, as I was researching the, the museum a little bit, your, and, and you've mentioned it as well, your, your position is to present the history of, of uh, nuclear sciences without necessarily judgment one way or the other. And so with uh, obviously very passionate docents who have been in the industry, worked with, you know, retired military, have worked in, in laboratories and things, how do you, how do you coach them to maybe not let their opinions come come through and and let the visitor have that that experience that they can make their own decisions well there and that is i mean it is a type of you know coaching we onboard volunteers just like we onboard our staff members our employees and our team members they are our team members so we want them to have a good understanding of what to expect um, we have visitors from all over the world and a vast majority of our visitation, upwards of 85 to 90% are out of state. So you really never know people's opinions, um, their backgrounds or anything. And so it is onboarding, coaching, their passion for what they did, where they came from, whether they were engineers, scientists, physicists, many of whom actually worked on maybe some of our weapons, flew some of our airplanes. The passion that they have for what they did always comes out, but it is something that just saying, you know, this is an informal education area as far as a museum. We provide as much information as possible so people can make their own decisions about what they're seeing. And so it, in all my time at the museum, it hasn't been a problem. Everyone is very much oriented to telling the museum story and our mission in the most unbiased way possible. Um, it, it's funny, we will have some docents just breeze through certain exhibit areas, you know, maybe because I, I don't know quite as much as much about this area versus this, so let's walk this way. Um, but there's always a good experience. Very good. Well, with uh, with our audience, uh, of course, being pretty much 
focused on World War II. That's really the, the dawn of the atomic age as far as weaponry goes. And that obviously you have uh, displays that go along with that as well. Yes, and this display specifically is quite possibly one of my favorite areas of the museum. So this area was erected in 2017. This is an artist's rendition of what he believes the Los Alamos laboratories look like during the Manhattan Project. His name is Jim Sanborn. Jim Sanborn is also the sculptor, the same creator who created Cryptos found outside of CIA headquarters in Langley. He is world renowned. And so when this was put into our museum, it was so specific and so close to what you could look at as far as unclassified pictures and things about what the Manhattan Project looked like during that time that we have had people from all over the world come in and say, are you sure you can show this? Are you sure that this is acceptable for public viewing? And because of our proximity to Sandia National Labs, DOE, and NSA, we have a lot of people helping to make sure everything that we show is either unclassified, declassified, acceptable for public viewing, demilitarized. So this is um, something that really you cannot step inside of it, but it is by looking in, you can see just a brief glimpse into the past. And as a sculptor, if he did not find these objects as far as purchase them or they were donated to him, he recreated them as far as sculptures as well. Wow. So what are some of the artifacts that are inside this, this exhibit that we're looking at? It is everything. It truly is as far as some of the areas and objects that they were using to build the interior of Fat Man, um, the gadget. So the world's first atomic bomb, which its code name was Gadget, the secret name, to typewriters, lamps, all of the cording. You can hear the beeps and buzzes and um, little noises always. When, you, when we turn on the lights in the museum, many of the exhibits come to life. And so this is one of them. Um, some of the objects are, they, I, even if I have to step in to do anything, we are very, very careful because some are lead lined. And um, so we just have to be careful. But with any object, any artifact, it's up to us to preserve it in perpetuity. So that is something that it's not accessible to the public. Well, I'm not sure I'd want to step in there with all those cables on the floor either. <laughs> That's interesting, especially when you're wearing high heels. It's always a good time. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a, another view. Um, what What is the sort of, I guess, bronze, brass uh, kind of object that's in the foreground? So again, and you see the Geiger counter next to it, which we do have many Geiger counters in that area and plus around it. But again, this is, it's just showing the core area of what they were working on when they were trying to put everything together to create the gadget. But also there are areas that do focus a little bit on Little Boy. So the gadget is the casing, the interior of Fat Man. And then um, Little Boy, we have, a, we have a casing of that as well. So the two weapons that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end World War II. So this is just, again, his artist's rendition, his peak to what, after looking at pictures, learning as much as he could, that he believes that they may have looked like during that time. Okay. One of the, uh, one of the interesting things, uh, you mentioned the Geiger counter. I see it on the, on the display there, but... Uh, do you have Geiger counters like actually in use? I mean, obviously you, you need to protect the, the public and your staff from, from any uh, radioactivity. Um, well, yes, we do. Um, and it's interesting. We have them in use in a variety of ways. Um, as far as checking the museum, again, one of the ways in which we partner with Sandia National Labs is their radiological department comes in annually to come and test areas of the museum from my office doorknob to the restrooms, to the store, to different objects. So it is something that we are tested annually um, just to make sure that everything is at safe levels, which they always are. And then we have a whole wall of Geiger counters, just different types um, throughout the years. We do sell, you know what, I might have to pause. I don't know if we've sold out of all of them, but I I think we still have some for sale in the museum gift store. And then we do have an education department. 
So oftentimes when we have special events, we do Nuclear Science Week every year, um, the third week of October. We bus in Title I students, over a thousand students during that week. We pay for their admissions and busing to come to the museum and learn about nuclear. And at that point in time, a lot of the Geiger counters come out so that they can test things um, as far as, you know, even are you radioactive? Right. So there are different things um, that we use them for, but they are in many areas of the museum. Yes. Very good. Um, obviously, the, your, the uh, decision to drop it, that is a focal point of, of uh, World War II, as, uh, as Jim had mentioned uh, earlier in the video. It is. I mean, this area, this has actually been redone just a little bit since this picture was taken. So the panel is no longer right there next to the flag. This is the American flag that flew at Trinity site in 1945. And there is a picture that if you come into the museum, I don't think it's on here, but you are able to see Trinity site and this flag flying and one of our limousines as well um, on the picture behind the car. But the decision to drop was very important to us. One of the things about the museum is we have permanent exhibitions, of course, throughout our 32,000 foot square or our 32,000 square foot area as far as the building. One of the areas is for temporary exhibits. So our temporary exhibits can range from some of the most popular have been the buff. So when we had an exhibit for multiple months about the B-52, we right now have one about da Vinci and some of the different um, things that he had come up with, all of his different technology and just everything that he did. We've had very hands-on engaging activities that are more focused on children, aviation, to um, gosh, just pretty much everything, nuclear medicine, nuclear energy. And so in that area, oftentimes we try to do the whole the whole area of what we focus on, which is all of nuclear. And at that point in time, we have We've even had pictures of all of the different photographs that were taken during the gadgets testing in 1945. And it was, I can't, gosh, it was, that's testing my brain right there. That was very, very long time ago, probably 2011. But it talked about the Trinitite that was created, the layer of green glass. And so there were photographs. It just, all of those areas, what I'm, again, going back to, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. Decision to drop has been a topic in that area as well. So we go, even though we talk about the whole gamut here, we try to focus on some aspects in our temporary exhibit hall annually. Very good. Well, now we can move outside. We, we saw a little bit of this on the uh, on the video, but um, is this is something that was recently built or the uh, the Trinity replica uh, tower, is is that been around for a while? This was erected in 2017 as well. So it was around the same time as the um, Critical Assembly, Jim Sanborn's exhibit. So this was something that a wonderful donor of the museum who is very passionate about the Manhattan Project and history. He was able to help us work with a fire tower center to build this replication of the Trinity Tower. To the best of our knowledge, this is the only one that is created. It's not quite as tall. It's probably about 10 feet shy of being the exact same height as the actual Trinity Tower was in White Sands, New Mexico. The gadget that you see hanging there, that we have two gadgets on display at the museum. Inside the museum, the gadget that we have is an actual casing. If World War II had not ended, that could have possibly been put to use. This, there was a TV show that was on, that was filmed outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, a few years ago called Manhattan. And the prop master came to the museum and said, I'd like to take measurements of your gadget for us to create one for the TV show. And when it went off the air, they asked if we wanted another gadget that really doesn't weigh too much. And so we hoisted this up to show what it looked like and we have it reinforced so that the New Mexico winds from the foothills don't really just start a pendulum. I mean, it gets pretty windy. Right. <laughs> so we had to make sure everything was good. But that is our Trinity Tower. All right, and of course, right next to the uh, B-29. Right next to the B-29. And I don't know if you have pictures, but a lot of our single seat jets, um, we have our only non-American airplane is the um, 
the MIG. And my predecessor and a curator who's no longer with the museum had strategically set the MIG surrounded by American jet fighters. So that was something I've always thought is interesting. It's kind of to the left of what you see in this picture. Okay. Um, but the B-29, that I would say the B-29 and our fat man and little boy are probably the two most photographed areas of the entire museum. Um, this is a nine acre outdoor exhibit area, but when people walk up to the B-29, that is something that it's just such a huge part of history. Oftentimes, is this the Enola Gay? Is this the boxcar? No, it's not the same. It's the same type. Um, we do restore all of our aircraft, trying to bring them to their former glory. So it is just the exteriors. But we've we're all very very proud of the aircraft that we have at the museum. Good. We we have some more photos coming up of the uh, of the outdoor exhibits. But um, this is something else you know, alluded to as well. Uh, Oppenheimer's limo. We do. We lovingly refer to it as Oppenheimer's limo. I don't, I cannot, there's nothing, my curator, my registrar have tried in vain to find you know, any pictures, anything with the serial number, anything. But this was a vehicle that we found in a junkyard when we were moving into the facility where we are now. And it was in Grants, New Mexico. And we were able to find funding. We are a nonprofit 501c3. So we have to raise the money to restore any of our objects including the airplanes. And this one was about $105,000 to restore the um, car inside and out. When we restore the airplanes, it's usually just the exterior, but it's equivalent to what we had to raise for some of the airplanes. <laughs> but it is there and it's above this vehicle is a picture of from Trinity that shows the American flag flying with this car in the picture. Very good. There's her. there's the B-29. There she is, yes. Do you know uh, a little bit of the history of, of this particular airframe? I do. So this airplane, it's something that I had to refresh my memory because I am the one who did all of the research and being director of communications many, many years ago, we restored this airplane. This was our second airplane to restore the exterior. Um, the first was our S-16 Fighting Falcon, and then we moved to the B-29. And this B-29, came to us, or not to us, but it was delivered to the Air Force just a few days after World War II ended. Um, so what I've been told by my predecessor is that it was delivered on August 9th, 1945. Um, so it was delivered at that point in time, and it was part of the 509th um, Bombardment Group, and I believe it was stationed in Roswell, New Mexico. So it went on all of those missions, um, even though it never saw combat, and it came into our possession as far as part of our collection in 1993. So again, that is when we were located on Kirtland Air Force Base. When we moved to the more culturally, the cultural hub, um, Old Town, we couldn't take any of our airplanes. Um, we were able to erect the Redstone rocket in front and that was interesting. I wasn't here at that point in time. I've heard stories, um, but in such a culturally significant area, putting up a rocket wasn't the most, well. It yes. So um, when now that we've moved and we're closer to Kirtland Air Force Base and we have more area, it's um, much more popular in Albuquerque, <laughs> so. <laughs> there you go, moving back inside, this is a, a interesting artifact this is probably one of my favorite and it is on temporary loan but we're hoping to um move the loan out another five years this is the dark cube this is a two inch by two inch uranium cube this is one of 664 cubes that was used um almost hung like a chandelier by heisenberg in hitler's race for the world's first atomic bomb so out of 664, currently only 17 of them are known where they are in existence. Now, when America came in and was able to confiscate all of these uranium cubes, a lot of them were melted down and given to Oak Ridge, Tennessee during Manhattan Project. Um, but all of the ones that were not melted, of course, they just kind of scattered into the wind. 
And this was donated by one of our board members, who is also a professor at the University of Maryland. And so he and one of his previous PhD students have been doing a lot of research on the dark cube. And so this is just something that's incredibly interesting to learn why um, the Nazis were not able in the race for the world's first atomic bomb, why they were not able to win the race as far as some of the most brilliant minds were Jewish. So they were run, you know, they were either killed or they were run off. Um, the lack of teamwork, the, the amount of competition between different scientists, it, they could not get there. And one story I heard, and I'm not sure exactly how accurate it is, but it did come from the researchers. Out of the 17 dark cubes, one is held in the position of, I do believe, Madame Curie's granddaughter, and it's being used as a doorstop in the UK, whereas we are protecting this one pretty much with our lives. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I noticed that. It's, it's a very, very uh, robust-looking uh, display container, and see it's, you've got the uh, safety screws on it, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon. That's exactly. With our security and then also, again, the help from the radiological department at Sandia National Labs to make sure that everything is completely safe for absolutely everybody who comes in here every day. You mentioned uh, support from, uh, you know, the, the military and, and getting decommissioned um, weapons. Uh, it's quite, a, quite an impressive display, but you only have a, a portion of what's actually in your collection on display. Correct. So we, this is in our Cold War exhibit area. We have the largest collection of declassified nuclear weapons in the entire world, but currently we only have one fifth of them on display. And it's because we ran out of room. So in the museum building that we have, we did not have enough space to bring all of them over, which they are still located on base. And we have been working diligently for about six years now to raise the funds to build a museum artifact center. And so it's, essentially a warehouse that is for visible storage that we will be able to do specialized tours and bring people in to see all of these Cold War heritage objects, which are nuclear weapons. And it has been an interesting dynamic. When we were raising the funds to restore the exterior of the B-52 or the B-29, money just almost poured in. I mean, those were such historic objects that really meant so much to so many people. When we're raising money to house nuclear weapons, it's a little bit of a different story. And so when we started six years ago, we were told a building would be about 250,000. Then it moved up to about 650,000. And now I'm working with raising 1.4 million to put these, the remaining objects in. Um, but again, all of them, they are very, very significant to the Cold War time frame. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have the Trident. Um, we have so many, we have the Honest John. This is a very important part of who we are because we are the history. So we tell the story of where we came from. Again, Cold War and Manhattan Project, but that does include weapons. Um, it, of course, includes all of the different aircraft that were nuclear related in one way, shape or form. Um, and this is very much of who we are. And speaking of aircraft the, uh, and the Cold War, uh, be, uh, B-47. Yes, this one, I, this one was interesting. We have not always had this one. This came in, I do believe this came to us in 2013. I do believe it was 2013. Um, one of the main things that I remember other than this being an absolutely stunning aircraft that people love coming out and just looking at, being able to walk up to our airplanes and almost touch them. This, when they had to take the wings and um, the wings off and the tail as far as the fuselage, fuselage coming through the Sandia Mountains, trying to get to the museum. The amount of media and press coverage that the museum received at that point in time, it was 2013. Um, I had just had my second baby. So that was an interesting, there was a lot going on, um, but it was an interesting time trying to get that. Um, since then, that was our last aircraft that we received until we did get the MIG. So we do currently have seven airplanes at the museum. Great. Including one of the longest lasting yeah. service, in-service aircraft, the uh, B-52. 
When the amount of people who come to our museum, we welcome upwards of 75,000 visitors per year. Um, the amount of people who come in and say, my father flew this airplane, or um, I work on this, or yeah, a different model, of course, but it just kind of depends that this has meant so much to so many people that even our docents, we've had docents who may no longer be with us, um, or some who still are, that this has meant so much to them. This one was a behemoth to us as far as restoration goes because of the surface area. This B-52B, this came to directly to Albuquerque from Boeing. And I have been told again in doing our research as far as my previous curator and my um, our previous executive director, that this was the last airplane to drop an atomic bomb for testing purposes. But it was beneficial for us when we were raising, I believe it was 125,000 to restore the exterior of this airplane, uh, to tell everyone within Albuquerque and our local community that this was Albuquerque's plane. It came to Kerlin Air Force Base and it didn't leave. So that was um, that was impressive, and that was something that was able to get us a little bit more focus um, from our local news outlets. And of course, what museum wouldn't be a museum without a gift shop? Gift store, everything's tax exempt, but that is something, okay. STEM is very important to us. So we do a lot of toys um, and games, just different things that you can purchase that are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then Oppenheimer, because of the movie, we have seen such a huge influx and in visitation because of the popularity of the movie. And so having different books, American Prometheus, um, different books about the Manhattan Project, um, Oak Ridge, Hanford, and of course, Los Alamos. It's very important to us to be able to give people a little bit of piece of New Mexico and who we are specifically. So always a popular place, especially during the holidays. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, you mentioned uh, just a moment ago um, uh, STEAM programs, and that's part of your outreach as well. We saw a lot of young people in, in, in the videos earlier, but um, that's, that's really uh, STEAM is, is something that's very important to the outreach of the museum. It is. We have a huge STEAM event coming up this weekend that we welcome upwards of 1,500 people in one day to come in. We bring in STEM professionals from all over the city and state, and they do hands-on engaging activities with people from all over. Um, it's followed by a STEAM week where they, the same professionals come in and we bus in again, Title I students, over a thousand students during that week to have free access to the museum and learn, whether it is um, making slime, whether it is is learning about fusion with using balloons. There's always something. But homeschool is very important to us. We have camps that follow the Albuquerque Public School break schedule. So we bring in students from pre-K all the way through 12th grade in a variety of ways to light the fire, really get them interested in STEM and nuclear. Um, I'm working very heavily with someone who is a laboratory employee now who he was a camper with us many years ago and then he became a counselor and then he went off to college and then he came back and now he's helping as a volunteer and helping us raise money for the Museum Artifact Center. So it, we try to make a difference with all of the young people, especially in New Mexico when we are one of the last as far as education in the United States. We like to be an outlet to bring kids into a inclusive environment where they are welcome to just learn at their own pace. That's awesome. So, and not only focusing on the Albuquerque area, but you also host a worldwide uh, nuclear science week as well. We do. Nuclear science week started 15 years ago. And this is a worldwide, it's a celebration of nuclear and the men and women who live, who work in it every day. And there are five pillars of nuclear that we focus on for Nuclear Science Week, and it is space exploration, energy, medicine, global leadership, and innovation and technology. And this really does focus a little bit more heavily on energy because so much of their industry really got on, got on board with it. But we work with people throughout the world from Canada and UK, Australia, Japan every year. 
I'm the chair of the International Steering Committee, and we do a national host city event every year. This past year, it was in San Diego, held at Balboa Park. Mm -hmm. But we have partners that try to get the word out as much as possible to a variety of communities all over. And it's always been interesting, having been in Albuquerque, when I'm around students in Albuquerque, New Mexico, when, they, when I ask, what do you think of when you hear nuclear? In Albuquerque, a lot of our students think bombs, weapons. You always hear the Simpsons, always. But those are some of the things that they say. I've been at speaking engagements for Nuclear Science Week, maybe um, on closer to the East Coast where there's more power plants, nuclear power plants. And I'll say to students, what do you think of when you hear nuclear? And oftentimes it's electricity, a light bulb, turning on the lights. So it's so different depending on where you are. Me being from West Texas, it's Amarillo. So Pantex was very big on where I grew up. And so that's something that's always unique, having different people from all over the world coming to the museum. And I love the opportunity through Nuclear Science Week. About how many people attend? For Nuclear Science Week? Yes. Oh, gosh. It just depends. Um, we do an international impact report every year, but it's thousands and thousands. It is celebrated in places where they don't even document what they're doing, whether it's a little office party to a whole community. In Aiken, um, so in Georgia and South Carolina, it's very, very important to them. And they have week-long events that whole communities and towns. Um, for us, this past year, when we held the National Host City event in San Diego, my museum team planned it. And we went to Balboa Park at Fleet Science Center, and it was almost 1,300 people in that one day alone. So that was just bringing people in for free into Balboa Park, into the Fleet Science Center, and learning about nuclear um, from people from MIT, Southern Nuclear, Idaho National Labs, um, Oak Ridge. It was a whole variety of people coming together to give that community more information about nuclear. Sounds like an, an exceptional event. And one of the, one of the groups that you work with, uh, the Atomic Heritage Foundation, is also very important uh, to the museum. We, yes, the Atomic Heritage Foundation, they're very near and dear to our hearts. The president and founder, Cynthia Kelly, she partnered with our museum in 2018. And so the museum, we are able to preserve and manage the Atomic Heritage Foundation websites. So Voices of the Manhattan Project and AHF. And this is a grouping of over 600 oral histories from the Manhattan Project, the women and men who worked on the Manhattan Project. And this does include Groves, it does include Oppenheimer. And so we are the ones who are able to preserve this in perpetuity for our community. And one of the things, it's always interesting how far AHF goes because researchers, teachers, educators, students, um, people just interested in the Manhattan Project really visit this website that our museum alone, we may see 20 to 30,000 views and impressions each month. The AHF websites alone are 200 to 300,000 per month. It is just a constant visit of people wanting to learn more. Even when I was back in my studies for museum studies, we were, it was a it was a course or an assignment that I was working on controversial exhibits, you know, throughout history. And of course, I picked the Enola Gay and Smithsonian. And so that was something that it was so interesting to start looking that up and researching. And there, there were stories even in AHF's website from that. So it's a, it's a wonderful site for anybody doing research or educational type needs. Good. Uh, and what's the website address for that? Just by going to atomicheritage.org, we have changed the URL a little bit to make it co cohesive with the museum to show that the partnership, but atomicheritage.org will take you to that. Great. In the, the few moments we have left, um, anything that we've not covered uh, that, that you'd like to make sure our audience knows about? 
Sure. There are always opportunities to get involved or even write your name in history. There are, of course, with the Museum Artifacts Center, we're still raising money. I'm about 400,000 away from finishing the building for the declassified nuclear weapons for all the Cold War heritage. Um, but there are opportunities as far as writing your name in history. If you were to go to our website, which you see here under support, under donate or museum artifact center people can buy a plaque and commemorate their father or their mother or themselves as far as we're really looking to memorialize people who really gave during the time of the cold war um, you can buy bricks you can buy pavers there are all kinds of things to do people who are local we always invite people to come into the museum go, come to some of our events heritage events or our gala is coming up um, but there's always ways to really connect including becoming a member as a 501c3 we're always bringing in money um, as a nonprofit through admissions facility rentals people get married at our museum there are often there's all different ways to really become involved excellent I was if you didn't mention it I was going to mention getting married in the museum that uh, that would <laughs> it would be a, a very unique venue it is it is and oftentimes there might be a reception just at the museum but some the ceremony is as well and oftentimes military um oh, the b29 right under the wings of the b29 or the b52 that's been a, a popular area excellent any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up tonight no i'm just i'm very very pleased to have been a part of this and thank you for letting me share about the national museum of nuclear science and history it's very much a passion of mine and i'm very proud of what we do and what we're able to bring to our community very good well uh jennifer thank you for for being a guest tonight and uh, thank you to our audience for uh, for joining us on this uh, kind of behind the scenes tour of the uh, of the museum Again, if you have any feedback on any of our shows or something that you'd like us to cover in the future, please send Leah Block an email at uh, media at cafhq.org. Until next week, thank you for joining us on Warbird Tube. I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.